We're meeting this afternoon in Augusta, Georgia, at the home of Lori Bedell, excuse me for the delay, with uh, Maurice Jean Pebbles from Arizona in this week visiting his daughter and her family. Uh, he is now going to relate his experiences during World War II as a Marine veteran. I am Fred Gailey, representative of the Augusta Richmond County Historical Society, conducting an interview on November 30, 2008, in Evans, a suburb of Augusta, Georgia. Jean, let's hear your story from your experience beginning with Pearl Harbor Sunday, December 7th, 1941. Yeah, as a prelude, I would like to say that in a few years past, uh, I started writing the memoirs on the, uh, uh, my time in the service. The information I'm presenting today is from memory that I uh, uh, hopefully can remember accurately. Uh, uh, some information was taken from the 5th Marine Division uh, book, which lists the entire complement of the division, the section on those who were killed and the section on those who had been wounded. Also, it listed uh, people that got medals and uh, accommodations. In my write-up, I was more specific in identifying the personnel in my platoon that were killed or wounded at the particular time that they were wounded and killed. This information was received or got from uh, microfilm that I uh, got from the archives in Washington, D.C., so it's very accurate. On December the 7th, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, I was a senior in high school, and that Sunday I was working in the drugstore, as usual, and uh, <clears throat> I was making a delivery, and the home I delivered to, they had the radio on, and I heard the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor. When I returned back to the drugstore, I uh, spread the news around, and one of the, the cooks got hysterical and was crying because her brother happened to be on Pearl Harbor at that particular time. But luckily, we found out later that he was safe and had been harmed. On the next day in high school, <clears throat> we heard President Roosevelt's speech where he declared war on the Empire of Japan. Many of the <clears throat> seniors at that time immediately just quit going to school and went and signed up, but I was determined that I was going to graduate in another six months, and I wanted to finish high school first. At this time of the country, President Roosevelt was just trying, still trying to get us out of the Depression area. Uh, we had become an isolationist country, and he was trying his best to keep us out of the raging war that was over in Europe at the time. We were sending supplies over there, though, to help them out. If the Japanese had known how weak we were and ill-prepared for a great war, they could have hit the West Coast, and we'd been in a lot of trouble. But the American Republic has always been a resilient group of people, and immediately all pitched together Businesses, plants started booming, building stuff for the uh, war. I quit, uh, after I graduated, I quit uh, working in the drugstore and started working at an electronic facility, um, doing some testing, <clears throat> and signed up for the draft when I reached 18. A good friend of mine named Bob Riley and myself, we decided we'd try to get in the services together and so we could serve together. And for some reason or other, we came up, we'd go join the Army at the, uh, and get in field artillery. Well, Bob got it called before I did, and he wrote me a letter a week later, and he says he was in the Marines, so that changed some things. A couple weeks later, I got called up too, and luckily I got in the Marines also and head for... Uh, Marine Depot at San Diego. 
<clears throat> we arrived there and met a guy who thought he was God Almighty, I think, but they called him a DI. <laughs> and he let us know in no uncertain terms that we belonged to him. And when he said something, we was to jump and do what he said. Later on, we learned that this was a, a good philosophy because when somebody gives a command, it may be the one that saves our lives. We did a lot of marching, a lot of calisthenics, shooting the rifle. And I'd never been out of the state before, never fired any big uh, rifles. So I wasn't as proficient as I would like to have been, but I did make marksmen, which was considered to be good enough. <clears throat> got a letter from Bob and he stated that he'd signed up for the paratroopers so when the slip of paper came around I did the same thing. Well as luck would have it we would never get together. He was signed to the 2nd Marine Division, fought on, on Tarawa and I was heading to Camp Gillespie in El Cajon to take my parachute training. The first two weeks was old calisthenics, running, learning how to pack a chute, because we uh, found out that what chute we were going to jump with, we had to pack. So we made sure that it was put together in the right fashion. <clears throat> By the end of two weeks of all the tumbling and stuff that we was doing, we were so sore we could hardly sit down. The third week we was going to the uh, captive tower and the flyaway towers, which was about 200 feet high. You get in the harness and they haul you up to the top and trip you off on the captive tower and the guide lock wires would guide you down to a mat down there that looked like a postage stamp. And you learn how to land with a soft landing by bending your knees when you hit the mat. And then we went to the flyaway tires which cuts you loose and you get the first impression of what it's like to float down with a parachute and learn how to tumble when you land. This all went well. And the uh, fourth week, we just go to the aircraft and start coming, jumping out of planes. I don't think I was ever scared, but I was always nervous every time we was getting ready to load on the plane. Now, there was DC-5s that uh, McDonnell built. Many years later, when I was working for the Department of Defense in one of the facilities I was working in, uh, there was a McDonnell Douglas representative there. And uh, <clears throat> I told him we jumped from DC-5s that they made. He said, no, we didn't make no DC-5s. So after arguing quite a bit, he finally decided to go check it out. And one day he came to me with a picture of the old aircraft that we was jumping out of. They built about 12 of them. Well, the, each jump, we jumped at 1,000 feet. And there was six to fifth, uh, 12 to 16 people at each jump. Uh, the first jump, I was about halfway back, and when the jump master said hook on, you'd <clears throat> hook your static line on the guy wire. He'd check it out, make sure that everybody was all hooked up properly. And he said, stand by and go, and we just rushed out and jumped out of the plane. The Army kind of hesitated when they, uh, their paratroopers jumped out at the door, and I didn't want that. It was much better just to run and out the door. <laughs> And uh, about the second, third jump, uh, for some reason or other, I moved up to about the second or third position. So when they said, stand by, I'm looking right outside the door then. And I said to myself, is this $50 extra a month really worth it? But we got through the six jumps of our original training, and I didn't have any problems. Um, Continued uh, throughout the time that I was at Camp LS, we made a total of uh, 13 jumps. But after the uh, fourth week, we was full-fledged Marine paratroopers. It was a, a good, one of the best camps. It was small, but it was one of the best camps that I was ever stationed at. Chow Hall, we went in, sat down at the tables. We had paratroopers that had got uh, mess duty that would serve us and all this. Food was wonderful, and uh, the time spent there was uh, something that uh, we could always remember. Sometime uh, a few weeks later, we jumped on the town of Escondido and took over the town. Of course, this was all prearranged, and uh, then they had a 
50 mile force march back to the camp and we pulled in late that night. Uh, as luck would have it, old Pebbles, he got drawn for mess duty. <laughs> and while I was serving that, most of the people that uh, I went through uh, training with at Camp Gillespie was shipped out to New Caledonia in the South Pacific. And I was stuck there at Camp Gillespie. Uh, they was making a film Gung Ho with Robert Ryan and Ruth Hussey. And they did a lot of the shooting there at uh, Camp Gillespie and showed paratroopers jumping out of the plane. And Robert Ryan, he got out of the harness on the captive tower and they put me in the harness and took me out of the picture. But my time as a movie star was short rated because they didn't use that particular <laughs> cut in the movie. But we kept hearing that uh, the paratroopers and rain raiders were going to be um, disbanded and make up a new uh, marine uh, division. Uh, they brought the, all the paratroopers back from New Caledonia and in that group there was a lot of uh, paratroopers that had uh, was seasoned uh, Marines. They would fought on Vela La Vela during the Can uh, Water Canal uh, uh, expedition. So we had some people that could help us in what we was to expect when we uh, got into battle. On January the 1st, 1944, we moved to Camp Pendleton and the 5th Division was born. I became part of the 27th Marines, uh, 3rd Battalion, Company H. And we had eight months of uh, training, consistently attacking small hills and rugged terrain, uh, really preparing us for what was to come. At Camp Pendleton, we changed our liberty status and, and ended up going to uh, LA for our, our liberty. One of the Marines had a car and his five of us pitched in and for the gas and uh, that's where we spent our uh, liberties up there. I didn't drink so I was pretty much a loner and I'd always went to Hollywood to went to the movies and different studios where they was making pictures. Got to meet uh, Fred McMurray on one set and I went to a couple of studios, radio studios where they was making the broadcast and seen Dinah Shore two or three times and uh, the hip parade one time, I got in there and there's very young Frank Sinatra on the stage singing. And the front row was lined with little teenagers with opera glasses that was looking at Frank Sinatra right in front of them. And every time he'd shake a leg or something, they'd let out some screams. But the movie stars at that time <clears throat> was a different caliber than they are today. They really pitched in and did a lot for the military personnel, helping them out and making them feel wanted and thankful for what they was doing. They had bought a uh, large house in uh, Hollywood and uh, they called it the Hollywood Guild Canteen. Now this was different from the basic Hollywood Canteen. They had a lot of cots set up where the military, uh, when they was on leave, had a place to sleep served three hot meals a day, and usually it was a few young girls there that you could talk to at night, which uh, made it real nice and it was comfortable. One night I was uh, hitchhiking back to go hit the sack, <clears throat> and a uh, car, big car stopped to pick me up, and I opened the door and lights went on around the baseboard of the back seat. And I got in, sat down, looked over, and there was John Carradine sitting next to me. The younger generation probably knows his son better than no John was. David was Kung Fu, Kung Fu, I think it was, and uh, he made uh, several films of that and uh, television uh, movies. After eight months of <clears throat> training there at Camp uh, uh, Pendleton. We got the word that we was uh, getting ready to move out to uh, going to the Big Island of Hawaii. <clears throat> On August the 12th, uh, we went down to San Diego, boarded the ships down there, and headed for the Big Island. The, there's a rancher that owned a considerable amount of property in there out in the 
middle dry portion of the island. And they allowed the Marines to build a uh, tent camp and they called it Camp Tararwa. We had, <clears throat> see we got there in August and we started doing uh, a lot of field practice, shooting with live ammunition. Uh, on one of the uh, ammunition, the top sergeant got killed and uh, nobody knew what happened. Was um, I was mad at him or whether he took a stray bullet. And then the next day they tried to reenact this and uh, somebody picked up a grenade and it was a dud and it went off and he got killed also. So even while we was there, we were faced with situations that we was going to <clears throat> get to when we hit the island. The only thing wrong with uh, that particular uh, tour of duty on Hawaii is uh, we didn't have any hot water and we had to take cold showers, which wasn't real good. But about the last month we was there, we finally got hot water. Around Christmas time, we got the word that uh, we were just about ready to move out and hit an island just south of the mainland of Japan. We didn't know any particulars, but we had seen some uh, picture of the map in one of the buildings that looked like a big pork chop that we was going to land on. <clears throat> on December the 30th, we head for Hilo, boarded the ships, and uh, headed out to sea. We had one day we spent at Oahu, and we got to walk the beaches there and see a little bit of that area. The next night, we made a uh, night landing on the island of Maui, and then we headed for Anawitok. <clears throat> We pulled in there in the evening, and the next morning we looked around, and man, there was just ships all over the place. And uh, we was going to make a landing there, but the waves were about 20 feet high, and it was just impossible without somebody getting hurt to get aboard the Higgins boat. <clears throat> oh, this is 1945? Uh, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, so we left in and we talked for the last 750 miles where we would hit Iwo Jima on the 19th of, of February. Now for a moment, if I may, what were, your, what were you being trained to do as a combat Marine? What was your role or function as far as your skills and your, your duties uh, as a member of the platoon or the squad that you were part of? Well, we acted as a whole, and we was trained to work together, watch the other person, watch your own back. And I don't recall of ever being afraid of what I was to expect. I, I, the only medal that I was wanting was the Purple Heart, because I kind of felt that I was going to get wounded. I had, didn't have any doubts about that. You had that premonition that yeah. you weren't going to get unscathed through <clears throat> right. combat coming up. But I don't recall that I was ever scared. Of course, every night in the foxhole, I always said a little prayer. And uh, I'm sure he heard me because I had about seven close calls, five of which was meant for me. And, uh, but as far as being scared, uh, you, you couldn't let that take over because it was a detriment to what you had to do. Because you're not only trying to save your life, but you've got the lives of your buddies that you're thinking about also. You also mentioned uh, being trained as a BAR man, Browning Automatic Rifle. Why, how is that different from someone carrying a carbine? carbine? <clears throat> well, to go back just a hair, when I was still in the paratroopers, when we jumped, we had a folding stock 30 caliber carbine which wasn't much firepower. The BAR was a, a automatic weapon that you squeeze the trigger, it cut off several rounds, or you could put it on full automatic and it would just blast away. I found out that if you turn the sear 180 degrees, I could squeeze off one shot and then put it on full automatic if I wanted to full blown and empty a magazine. So it was a good firepower weapon and uh, the only problem with on Iwo Jima 
was the sand would get into the magazines and then it would jam your gun. So you'd have to keep everything spotless clean. We didn't have any little glad bags or anything like that at time that you could put it in to keep the sand out of the magazine. So it was a weapon.